Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Coming to you from Rochester, Minnesota. Strong like a tree. Our town. There's roots where I stand. Oh, I Ever wonder who the state auditor is? Well, we're here with our very own state auditor, Julie Blaha. Welcome to Our Town, Julie. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. So I think um, everyone has this question. Um, probably some of our viewers might have this question. Um, but could you tell us a little bit about what a state auditor does and what your primary responsibilities are? It's a great question. And if you're listening and saying, I don't remember learning about what that is, don't feel bad. It is different in every single state. So in Minnesota, uh, the state auditor oversees over $40 billion in local government spending. And then this year, we're also adding the oversight of about $20 billion in federal spending that's done by the state. So we basically take um, examinations like audits and investigations, uh, we provide direct support to local government officials, training, software, and then we also do data analysis. We pull all this, this information together so that local leaders can make a fact-based decision. Because um, ultimately, the point of all of this is so that we protect the solutions that people come up with close to home. You know, right now in these divided times, there's nothing more, I think, unifying than solving something together with your neighbors. And so where we can do that often is in local government. So we're really proud to protect that, something so important in these divided times. Fantastic. Um, I'm sure some people have been hearing a little bit about um, your work um, as it, um, as it uh, pre refers to um, the forfeiture laws. So um, mm -hmm. changes to the Minnesota forfeiture laws have been a topic of um, a lot of conversation recently. Um, mm -hmm. So. Can you talk to us a little bit about what asset forfeitures are and what kind of property are we talking about um, when we're talking about that? Right, asset forfeiture, uh, we collect data on the situations where law enforcement may seize property that may eventually be subject to forfeiture. So it's usually, you know, other use or sale. And so we track the forfeitures that happen uh, that are connected to state laws. Uh, so uh, in Minnesota, what we find out is that most of the forfeitures in Minnesota, like 76%, um, are um, small forfeitures. And by small forfeitures, we mean $15 or under. Now, the whole point of forfeiture is to remove the instrumentality of crime. And I think we all agree that, hey, you know, if somebody's committing a crime, you want to take away the tools to do that. Uh, what's what's uh, an extra challenge, though, with forfeiture is that this is a seizure that happens before you've had your day in court. And so we have to be really careful. What are you going to take away from somebody before they've had their day in court? If it really does prevent crime, I think you can make some uh, a case for that. But I think in the case of small forfeitures, you know, some somebody, you know, taking a hundred dollars, uh, uh, a uh, you know, a car that uh, maybe their only mode of transportation is that really limiting crime? We do know that these small forfeitures really impact people, low-income people, disproportionately. I mean, you think about it. If you had the average size of a small forfeiture is around $450. You know, if if you've lost $450, if you're, uh, if you're in poverty, shoot, that can be the difference between making rent or not. Uh, that car could be the difference between getting to work or not. And so, yes, remove the instrumentality of crime, but I don't think anybody wants us to be assessing homelessness or joblessness before someone's day in court. So when we looked at the numbers, we saw this opportunity to reform law enforcement in a way uh, that uh, protects people who are in poverty, at the same time, doesn't really rattle the system. These small forfeitures only add up to just fractions of a percent of a public safety budget. So you've got a place where losing a small forfeiture isn't going to necessarily, you know, change somebody's budget by much, but it could really impact someone's day-to-day -day life. And that's a great place to look at this one. That's fantastic. I mean, I, I think when people are maybe looking at this on paper, they're not thinking this is actually an equity issue um, in need of reform. And so um, that's wonderful that that's kind of the path that you all have taken. And um, we're going to take a quick break, but I wanted to get us started a little bit on the annual report and some of the key takeaways that, um, that, that your office had released around this um, and how it supported the newly passed legislation. 
Oh, you bet. One of the things we saw this year was a, a group of, of people coming together around forfeiture reform. And we're talking everybody from the ACLU to sheriffs. This is a group that uh, isn't always all on the same page, but they were able to find some real agreement around particularly small forfeitures. And so we were really helpful, uh, real excited to be able to lend our data to help uh, help that effort. You know, uh, and so what they were saying is, OK, so can, is there a place for reform? So what I will find is like, well, you know, we talk about 76 percent of our forfeitures are under fifteen hundred dollars. And this was, of course, in 2020. That added to about one point two million dollars. But again, across the state, that's maybe four tenths of a percent of the budget. So here you've got a, a situation where you have big individual impact, but really small system impact. What a great place to come together. Well, we're going to take a quick break and oh, sure. we will continue the conversation right after when we come back. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you in a few minutes. Be sure to stick around. We have much more coming your way on Our Town. We continue our discussion with the state auditor and we learn all about the upcoming Med City Arts Festival. But up first, we meet an asylee from Cameroon who came to the United States seeking not just a better life, but a way to survive in this week's Our Culture segment. My name is Christian Chinongong. I'm a Cameroonian. I've been in the United States since January 8th. 2020, that's when I was granted asylum. I am a, a, a human rights activist. I am a political analyst. I am the founder and chief executive officer of a humanitarian organization, The Voice of the Voiceless, in Cameroon that has been helping the needy orphans, uh, refugees, uh, internally displaced persons. Cameroon is um, a country in the sub-Saharan Africa that was colonized by the British and the French. Uh, it's a bilingual country and because of uh, its history of colonialism. So it's been split into two countries, which is the British Southern Cameroon and the French Cameroon. And uh, up to today, we have a long history of fighting, a long history of wars in Cameroon. The president of the Republic of Cameroon has been in power for over 36 years and he is a French speaker. The second person in government is a French speaker and all the ministers, they are French speakers. So growing up, and as, an, growing up as an Anglophone or as an English speaker in Cameroon is hell on its own. You live in a country where your education means nothing. You live in a country where uh, carrying an identification document as an English speaker means nothing. So we were practically foreigners in our own country. When the, the Anglophone crisis uh, started in 2016, uh, we called on the government to resolve the crisis. And because we are in a dictatorship, any person that calls on the government to perform his duty, its duty automatically becomes an opponent of the government. And uh, because I was involved, I was one of those people who was, uh, was calling on the government of Cameroon to find a credible solution to the crisis that has killed more than 8,000 people, burnt down more than 250 villages in Cameroon, displaced millions of people, uh, created orphans, internally displaced persons. The government saw me as a threat. So I decided to run away from Cameroon to save my life and to save these people, which I continue to fight for them today, even as I'm in the United States. I left Cameroon and I had to move through high sea to Nigeria, which is the neighboring country, Cameroon, because I could not cross any borders. I could not move across, uh, pass through the airport. And I had to use the high sea because there was no security. I got to Nigeria and uh, from there I was able to secure a flight to South America where I landed in Ecuador. From Ecuador, I had to grapple with the police all along, moving from through Colombia, walking across the Darien Gap for two weeks, day and night without food. And I had to move through Panama, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, right up to Mexico, where I was able to get myself I was able to cross the borders in the United States of America. So from there, um, 
I was uh, put under immigration court studies for seven months until I was taken to court and acquitted. Defining myself as a refugee, I believe that the United States has been a home. It's been made home for me right now because that is the only home I have. I can't call Cameroon a home when I'm not able to move back there. I will tell you that there is hope because there is always hope and you will always win there where there is hope. I believe that it's just a matter of time and someday, somehow, our lives will be back to normal. For more information about this story and other Our Town features, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter at KSMQ hashtag Our Town or KSMQ.org slash Our Town. Danielle Teal, your moderator for Our Town, The Spotlight. It is a segment that really focuses on organizations, events, and happenings across Rochester. Today, I have two guests from the Med City Art Fest, and they're going to share a little bit about themselves as well as how they got involved. Hi, I'm Julie Johns. And I'm Yvette Martinez. And we started Med City Arts Festival in 2019. Um, Yvette has been my partner in crime for a couple years with this and a bunch of other projects that we're doing. And we thought um, Rochester needs some art festivals and some more events to activate downtown. Uh, and we'll be downtown again on September 18th this year at 1st and 3rd, same place as Thursdays on 1st, and uh, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Perfect, so when people walk up, what are they gonna see and what's gonna be offered? We offer vendors, we offer practice classes, are the, are the art classes, we offer competition between artists, amateur and children. We have a prize, money prize, Jill, Jill Suck Award, uh, $500. So we, we offer a lot of different things. We have a stage where we have different cultural uh, presentations of dances and, and music. Um, the diversity uh, is present all the time. And we have a stage music stage right and we have some great musicians um coming from the twin cities and elsewhere mm -hmm. we have three bands starting at six and we've got great interactive art we're going to have um community participate in a string sculpture we have an abstract paint off plain air competition and uh beer and food and yeah, beer oh, we're all good <laughs> That's perfect. So um, how has the pandemic ha impacted your planning and, and do you anticipate a lot of engagement in the community with this event? We are uh, very much promoting mask wearing. We're doing that on all of our social yeah. media. The city is also promoting how to be safe during these events. Mm -hmm. So we're, our booths will be six feet apart. Our vendors are gonna have hand sanitizer available. Uh, they'll be monitoring overcrowding at their booths. We're going to have some chalk art six feet apart so everybody is reminded of social distance um we'll put our chairs for the stage six feet apart and we're just going to try and have as safe as event as we can that's great and where can where can people find details about this event well you can check our website out at midcityartfestival.org or you can uh, visit our facebook page Hi everyone, this is Michael Wojak with your Our Town Rundown, coming to you once again from my COVID-19 Delta variant home studio. RPU recently announced that rates next year are projected to go up at 2.5% for both water and electric. I was able to spend a few years on the board of directors for RPU and actually realized that over the last 20 years, the rate of increases in utilities have been well below that of inflation. That's a little bit offset by the imposition of a customer charge, which is that flat rate that you're seeing on the bill. What not a lot of people realize is RPU does the water and electric utilities, but we have additional utilities in the city of Rochester, that being stormwater and sewer for example and those charges have actually gone up at a more substantial rate but overall when you compare us to neighboring cities the quality of our um, public utility enterprise and our rates are quite competitive with those around us so I do appreciate all the work those at RPU are doing on our behalf 
Dr. Fauci, the Dr. Fauci, will be giving the address to uh, Mayo Clinic Biomedical School here shortly. Now, it's going to be a virtual address, so you will not have that opportunity to introduce Dr. Fauci to your uncle who saw that YouTube video that shows why he's all wrong, but still what an incredible honor for our community in that graduating class. Thursdays on first will be ending on September 9th. That will be the last one of the season. It's a fantastic event in Rochester, something that celebrates our beautiful downtown. If you haven't seen that new finish First Avenue, please go take a look. Fall Fest, a fixture at Quarry Hill every fall will be going on September 11th uh, from 10 to 5. Now what's different this year is you actually have to pre-register in advance and there's timed entry. Don't miss out on this. It's a great way to celebrate one of our great regional parks here in the city of Rochester. Labor Day weekend is coming up. Very much um, everyone enjoy the long weekend. Be safe and thank you to those in the labor movement who helped uh, have this holiday and make working conditions what they are today. Danielle Teal from Our Town Walkabout, and we're talking to our wonderful guest, Nora. She is remote at the Neon Green Studio Pop-Up Art Cart at the Peace Plaza in Rochester. Woo! Hello. We are excited to have you, Nora. So can you go ahead and share a little bit about yourself and the concept behind the Pop-Up Art Cart? Absolutely. So Neon Green Studio is a business that we opened in 2019 at the Castle. Um, so we had a studio with an art bar. People could come in, um, select the project, sit, work with all of our materials. We provide everything, including instruction if needed for artists really of all ages, creative abilities. We wanna just get people kind of in that creative um, mindset. You're welcome to sit down and do some painting. Absolutely, yeah. Yes, yep. so, you, got a, you got a customer um, right there. <laughs> you got one right there, yeah. <laughs> we applied for a grant through the Rochester Downtown Alliance to offer this pop-up um, activation throughout the downtown area and so this is one of one of several little spots that we stop a lot of people think this is just for kids and it's not it's really for everybody so Nora can you take a little tour of the the cart so absolutely it looks like? so we've got a couple of kiddos here working on some different paintings um, another gentleman over here working on that but then here's kind of what we've got as our setup today so little canvases some greeting cards watercolor um, we've had actually my daughter teaching how to do um, different styles of friendship bracelets and we've had a couple of regulars coming to get like actually lessons from her on that. <laughs> That's great. You know, the goal for us has always been um, not to worry about exactly what you're making, but just that you're making something. Yeah. Thank you so much for hosting that. This is Danielle Till with Our Town Walkabout. Will you find me? Hope you find me. Welcome back, everyone. We are here talking to Auditor Blaha all about what the auditor does and, and it's a key legislation um, that was just passed. Um, at the top of the show, we were talking a little bit about that legislation. And Auditor Blaha, I wanted to know from you what role um, the findings from your office played in facilitating that legislation. You know, one of the best things that we do out of our office is we offer the kind of data that gets us all back on facts. And, and it's particularly important in these issues, uh, like when we talk about policing. There is intense emotion around policing. It's, it's a really, really high stakes, hot topic. And we're able to bring our numbers and help kind of calm the debate and say, all right, can we find something in the numbers where we can all agree? And uh, what I think our numbers were able to show was that they were on the right track, this coalition, when they were talking about small forfeitures. We were able to say, you're right, you're on the right track. This is something that will that is significant enough to make an impact, but it's still not going to rattle our system. So it's a safe place to start that discussion. So when you find those really magical places of big individual impact, but uh, easy absorption by the system, it gives you a place to start. And hopefully that leads to even further reform that continues to kind of improve our relationships, improve public safety uh, in good ways. So we're really proud that we can be that kind of calming force uh, that the numbers can be. I love that. The calming force of the numbers. <laughs> it's a great, it's a great rule. Uh, Instead of saying it's boring, right? And so, <laughs> so often when people hear about auditing, they, they think boring, but you know what? It's, it's the idea that it's calming and it's focusing and you can pull some of that emotion away and just have a good conversation. And, and I'll tell you, in times like these that we're in right now, who doesn't want a little bit of a boring conversation? You know, <laughs> we're here to provide, help you provide that. 
Fantastic. Uh, switching gears a little bit here, word around town is that you are a very talented crop artist. Um, what made you start doing that? Oh my goodness. You know, I, I have to say I'm a huge State Fair fan. So I, I am way into it. I've always loved looking at the crop art. And I saw a video about how to do it. It basically involves glue and seeds and a board. And I thought I could pull that off. And, and you know, we talk about the idea of like, the great Minnesota get together, pulling people together. Um, some of my favorite parts of the fair is when you pull different groups together and crop art pulls together crafters like me, weekend crafters like me with legitimate full-time artists. I mean, there are some amazing artists here and here's a place where we get to show side by side and I get to have a conversation and and it's still, we're still gluing beans to a board. So it, it also, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a humble activity. You know, you can't take yourself too seriously when you're trying to talk about what's the best millet to make, uh, to make a good background, you know? So there, it's, 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 it's just a wonderful, uh, fun event of just kind of unity and also not taking yourself too seriously. I love that. You've had some very funny and punny pieces. Um, I was really intrigued by the 2018 piece that you had when you were campaigning. Um, can I, can you tell me how many beans you used in that piece? Well, yes, I can, because uh, if you thought I took my campaign site and I wrote bean counter literally. And uh, as I'm really, as I'm putting the beans on for literally, I thought, oh no, what, what I can count this, <laughs> you know? So I did, I literally counted and there were 10,041 beans in that. Now that one had some smaller beans than this year's piece. I have a piece in this year. And if you go to our website, osa.state.mn.us, just type in Minnesota State Auditor, and you can enter your guess for how many beans are in this piece. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a way to, you know, to kind of help people see, connect with the auditor's office and connect with our data. So, you know, maybe you come there to make a guess on, on my beans to show off your bean counting ability, but maybe you stay there and take a look at the audit from your community, or maybe you look at one of our reports and start to say, oh, hey, you know, maybe this inspires you to help solve a problem in your community. So, you know, ultimately, all of this is really about making a connection. And I, I do the crop art so that you can be connected to our office and feel welcome to come on in and start digging through our numbers. You know, at the top of the show, you're talking about uh, the importance of local government. You were talking about the importance of connecting at that level. Um, mm -hmm. And, I, you know, that's that's fantastic in being able to use. I mean, as we're talking here, just pulling back the layers of the auditor. You know, I think people definitely think <laughs> <laughs> the auditor. What is that? Actually, audits just don't sound like something I want to, you know, wa want to know about. Please don't audit me. And I'm yeah. not a local government. I audit government. <laughs> You're safe. Uh, you know what? And so when you walk up and you walk to somebody's door and say, hi, I'm your state auditor, they're not always as exciting, excited to see you as you hope. So you really have to explain, hi, I'm your state auditor. I don't audit you. And then you can have a conversation. My job is to give you the data to do your to, to be involved in your community and come up with a fact-based decision. And then we can have a conversation. For sure. And you're highly visible as well. Um, you go to the Farm Fest. Can you tell us a little bit about why you attend that event? You know, I had that question a lot. Why, are you, why is the auditor at Farm Fest? And again, it's like, you know, we're, we're, we're counting our money. It's like, you're fine, you're fine. Uh, and so, but, you know, I thought that uh, Gary Wordish uh, of the Farmers Union, president of the Farmers Union, explained it really well. He said, you know, um, uh, farm bills, for instance, legislative federal farm bills, a farm bill is a basically a rural economic development bill. Now, one of the groups we oversee, set of groups we oversee are economic development authorities. And so these uh, partnerships between local government and agriculture are really important to help your community thrive. So if you care about local economies, you care about local ag agriculture. And so Farm Fest is a great place to really connect with people who are on the front lines of agriculture, who are actual farmers, who are actual producers. And, and talk about, okay, what, what do you need to know about your community to make good decisions? So, so I go there to see what numbers are you talking about? What data do you wish you had? And then our job is to take that information back to say, all right, is there a way we can pull some numbers together so that we can help raise the economic development of our rural communities? So it's a great place for, it's a, it's a perfect place for the state auditor. Yeah, so it certainly sounds like it. I know you're not that they've, also got, they've also got funnel cake. I, I'm going to admit that. <laughs> Just follow the funnel cake. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, as you're talking about the economic development, I think here in Rochester, um, you know, oftentimes when we talk about economic development, we're talking about us as a city, um, as, a, as, a, as right. an urban area. Um, and I, I just loved what you said about um, the rural communities and sort of, the, I mean, agriculture being a central part of economic development in those areas. So this uh, economic development ecosystem that we're a part of, um, I think is really important because I, I, you know, I myself am guilty of this here, being here in a, in a smaller city where economic development is all about sort of urban growth and, you know, things like that. So. But that urban growth is so important because, you know, one of the things that I think is best about local government is when we have a big idea that we want to attempt, it's hard to say, OK, we're going to do something nationally. No, we can test it out city by city. For instance, I think uh, the minimum wage is one example of that. You have a lot of people who test it out, raising the minimum wage to $15 city by city. You know, it's, it, we're, so we're getting data back. And I think that because we are able to see what that has done for the cities. And I, I would say on average, we're seeing that it's helped their economic development. Now I can understand why people say, I don't know if I want a national $15 an hour minimum wage just to start, but you know what, a city trying it, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I, so cities and towns and counties can be kind of an incubator or uh, kind of our, our, our test kitchen for our best public policy recipes. So I, 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 that's what it, the, one of the best things about local government. We get to try out new ideas and anything that works and we can actually spread that across the country. Well, that's a fantastic note to end on. Thank you so much, Adria Blaha, for joining us. Um, it was great to connect with you, learn more about what you do. And I'll definitely be uh, paying more attention. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today on Our Town, the show about Rochester. We'll be back next week for more on the show. In the meantime, be well and stay safe. I'm Nicole Fanoi Empire for Our Town, the show about Rochester. Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.